Sometimes you can know that God's about to move by the opposition you face in your life. This ain't in my sermon notes. Sometimes you can know there's no way that the devil would be fighting you as hard as he is fighting you if God didn't have a big plan for you. I know somebody's about to be set free and delivered. Christ is my eternal joy mine. Christ is my eternal joy mine. There's, there's no place in, in scripture that tells us to celebrate Christmas. It's not a commandment anywhere. And uh, celebrating Christmas doesn't make you Christian. Doing good things, buying toys and for orphans or doing a lot of nice things for people, giving gifts, helping people, that doesn't make you a Christian. It's nice. Being nice doesn't make you a Christian. Having holiday spirit doesn't mean that you have the Holy Spirit. Christmas season can bring out niceness. But it doesn't mean that you're saved. This is that season, that time where we celebrate joy. It's a time where people are focused on happiness, and family, and friends, and we come to that time of togetherness. And then because this is such an emphasis, we come upon seasonal woes where people can find themselves depressed, isolated, disappointed. Largely because while people are celebrating on one end and Drinking and substances seem to go along with the celebration. Carelessness goes along with celebration, and then you have loss. So a time of family can also be a time of the loss of family, especially on the dangerous roads during this season. So this brings about a great time of sadness to many people during a time when they were expecting it to be a time to be happiness. You have many people fighting during this season and finding themselves in great despair. So there's a tension between what's supposed to be in our minds versus what actually is. Help me, Holy Spirit. You see, our body has what I would call sensors for pain. It's good, when you feel pain, it's a, it's a good thing. It tells us that something's wrong in our body. And our soul has a similar thing where we are uncomfortable or feeling pain in the soul that tells us that something is not right with our soul. It experiences a pain. And when the, the name of God or the purpose of Jesus is tarnished amidst Christmas celebrations, there are many souls that just don't feel at ease. And this time becomes a, a, a difficult time because we have its purpose being the gift of salvation. This is the purpose of Christ, for us to, to be saved. He came for God to love the world and gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not die but have eternal life. So it's salvation versus monetization. And uh, the gift of God which came free to us, despite us, 
versus a lot of stuff, buying and selling that you have to pay for. And there's a contrast that's not sitting a lot of souls during this season well. They don't know what's wrong, but something is wrong. It's kind of like Jesus, who's an ordinary person. I mean, not really, but he's not the king. He doesn't have kingly authority or even Pharisee-like authority. Who's walking into the temple and he sees people, a temple that's supposed to be a holy place. He, he has no human authority to do what he does, but he just, he's, he's not, it's, he's just not well in himself to see them degrading the holy temple with buying and selling and, 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 and robbing people and stealing from people in the holy place. And he, he takes a whip and he whips these old men out of the church. My house shall be called a house of prayer. You've turned it into a den of thieves and robbers. Well, in the soul, there are many people who are so discontented about the gift of God being lost amidst all of the monetization of a season more bent toward building an economy than building the kingdom of God. There's souls that are just tossing and turning in pain, and they don't understand it as to why. Point number one, encountering God is special. The one who encounters God can't really describe it in words. Uh, you, you have different people with different stories. Paul, we just come across Saul at the time. He's persecuting the Christians. And Jesus smites him with blindness. He gets smitten with blindness and Jesus says, I'm Jesus. Why are you persecuting me? It's just an, an amazing story that he has. Jesus who had risen has now come and made himself known to Saul who has authority in the land to persecute the Christians. What a story. I mean, some of us, if you ask some people, like, what is their story? Well, how did they encounter God, you know? Some of us are embarrassed next to others because their, their story is just so awesome. And we feel like, I mean, it'd be like lightning came from heaven and it, it like struck me in my heart. And there were chariots around and angels. And, 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 and that's how I met God. And, and others would be like, um, I just... I just felt in my spirit to make a decision and I made it. No matter what your story is, for God, there's something that's special that's happening inside of you. And, and, and it's very, very special. There's a man by the name of Sadhu Singh. Sadhu Singh, an Indian, a uh, a Sikh, rather, I say a Sikh. He studied some Hinduism and uh, he was well known for good deeds. And he persecuted Christians, burned Bibles, made people not want in his area, not to want Christ. It was not the way, but he felt really empty inside, he said. And he got so low that he said, by this time, 5 a.m. tomorrow, I'm laying on the train tracks and I'm ending it all. When that 5 a.m. train comes, I'm done. Unless God reveals himself to me. He says he was finished. And at 4.45 a.m., this Seek this man who was studying even Hinduism and, and very pious and known for good things who didn't even like himself. At 4.45 a.m., he says, Jesus came to him and said, I'm Jesus. Why do you persecute me? Now him, 
of all the gods that could have come to him, he was shocked that it would have been Jesus. And he said the joy that came to him at this moment because had God let him do what he was planning to do, he would have perished for sure, eternally. To know that he cared enough to make his presence known in that way, at that time, I'm Jesus. He said he had so much joy, it was like an indescribable gold mine, except it wasn't gold, it was so much more valuable than gold, a joy mine. Indescribable or hidden, a hidden joy mine, because he can't really explain it with his words. There's some things in the spiritual realm that we just can't wrap words around. Can we turn to 1 Peter, the first chapter, the 8th verse? 8 and 9. I don't think this is on your screen. 1 Peter. Just before Revelation. Verse 1, verse 8 and 9. Mm. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So the goal of your faith, the salvation of of your soul. This is the whole purpose of your faith. And this comes with joy. For him, this joy was indescribable. A life-given presence that's hard to explain. And he, he mentions that there's new senses that we get. That we don't understand like an ant with antennas that senses the direction it's going to go and steers it away from danger, we have this Holy Spirit sense that directs our path, leads us and guides us in truth. He said, I can't really explain this very well, but the best way I could explain it is a guy named Zira Culber, known as the mathematical the mental calculator. They asked him before he was even a teenager, how many seconds are there in 11 years? Within four seconds, he gave on his first try the correct answer. They said, how did you do that? He said, it just came to my mind. There are some things in the spirit that really can't be explained. They're indescribable, but they just become a part of us. Who we're called to be, what we're called to do. Help me, Holy Spirit. And God reveals his perfect will and purpose to us. Point number two, life without God is hell. So we have suicide, depression, despair. It's common for people that don't know God. They don't know how to remove whatever makes them unhappy. And the question will be asked for Christians, why are you depressed when you have Jesus? And it could be that the Jesus that you have is not the Jesus of salvation. Perhaps it's the Jesus of monetization. Perhaps it's the Jesus of certain expectations of world. Perhaps it's a bling Jesus 
instead of King Jesus. This inner life, it needs fulfillment. And when it's unfulfilled, misery sets in. And when we're miserable, we are weaker towards sin. And sin kills joy. It kills our consciousness and makes more sin a reality for us. It create it kills the very state of being where our joy would sit, where God would come. Some, some say if joy came from riches, power, worldly possessions, and all the richest people, people would be so happy if that's where joy was coming from. But many wealthy people, people are not very happy. Jim Carrey said, I wish everybody could be like me and get all of their dreams fulfilled. Everything they ever wanted would come true. So they can realize that that's not what makes you happy. People think that if I leave this place and go to that place, I'll be happy. If I get from this church and go to that church, I'll be happy. If I get out of this relationship and I go to that relationship, then I'll have joy. If I run here to there, then I will find my joy. But joy rests in the heart. It's unlocked in the heart. In the heart. Sadhu Singh, in his example of a bird, he said it's like a scientist trying to discover the life in the bird by taking it apart, part by part, to discover which part of it has life. Only to realize the more he seeks for it, the more he's killing life. This world is very large. But it can't satisfy a very small heart. And our soul is really big. And it can only be satisfied by a much, much bigger God. Infinitely. An infinite God. And the soul can't rest unless it rests in God. Point number three, though the body dies, fruit remains. Our body can't stay joined to our soul forever. Our soul is ever growing, the body's not. After the body has fulfilled its purpose, as the instrument of the soul, it wears down, it tears, it ages, it gets sick, weak. The body can't keep up with the soul. Though the body will die, this is very, very big, though the body's going to die, the fruit from the body and soul together will remain. That's what remains, fruit. So we're asked to tread carefully the path of our salvation and to bear fruit. So when Paul encounters Jesus, Saul at the time, which is the name of the first Hebrew king, a prestigious name, when he encounters Jesus, he realizes he's been off course a long time. Now his name changes. He changes his name from Paul, excuse me, from Saul 
to Paul, which means little one. Little one who has little time. It is the Apostle Paul who says, redeeming the time for the days are evil. Another word for evil could be short because the evil are cut short is a theme all throughout scripture. Our time to serve God is little. We're little. Final point, procrastination is the trick of the devil. The devil tricks us into believing we've got plenty of time when he knows that our time is short. God is calling for us to build good habits, to overcome the habits during our wasted time. He's calling us to be faithful with our time. I remember like it was yesterday. I'm 45. I remember 15 and 16 like it was yesterday because this is the time when I was supposed to be an example and I was ashamed to be an example to my rap crew, my buddies, my music team. Some of them died and I never told them about Jesus. I thought we had time. I could tell them later. I didn't know they was going to get shot in that club. We don't have all the time we think that we have. So we're called to be faithful with the little time that we have soul and body together. Luke 16, 10, Jesus says, whoever is faithful with very little is faithful also with much. If we include this with the little time that we have on this earth, if we're faithful in our habits for God, then when God extends our time eternally, with him, we're going to be faithful. If we can't be faithful with the little time that we have now, even if God extended this time, we're not going to be faithful with it. It's not God who's cruel by condemning to hell. It is God's love and his justice that's calling for faithfulness so that hell doesn't have an eternal reign over the just. If we murderers and, and drunkards and all these habits that are self-destructive, if that continues for a long time, we're in trouble. So God's given everybody a purpose. God will use each one of us differently, but God wills to use us. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, in the 4th and 5th verse, it says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same God. 1 Corinthians 12, 11, all those are the work of the one and same spirit. And he gives them to each one just as God determines. God said to Ananias, don't be afraid of Saul. That's my instrument. I want you to think of an instrument. Think of a, a flute. Think of a bagpipe. A saxophone. All of these instruments take the same breath. But they all give different sounds. So it is, does God call each and every last one of us into eternal joy? 
and he wants to use us. I don't care how bad we may have been or what we have done. God is calling us and he wants to use us. And he wants us to be instruments for his glory, his spirit. And if God calls for you and calls for your attention, and you feel this indescribable sensation. When that happens, this is a joy of mine. This is calling you into something so pure. It's endless joy, even when the situations are not ideal. It's calling you out of depression. It's calling you out of despair. It's calling you into eternal glory. When we were praying this prayer of penance, I held in so much emotion. The Lord showed me just before I was to preach, just before something attacked and evil attacked my throat before preaching. The Lord showed me from the heavens a sword and God's hand handed me a sword. And I'm standing in front of you with joy unlimited as God, the sword represents the word of God, as God himself is affirming me, saying you give this word of God. I'm blessing you to do it. I can't tell you how in that moment, how I felt, how I feel. Like Paul said, of all sinners, I'm chief. I don't feel the worthiest to stand here before you. Sometimes I don't feel like I should be here. Sometimes I get just as discouraged as you do. But there is a mine of joy that is calling each one of us to be instruments for God. And if we are to allow God to breathe into us, then God's going to ensure that that joy fills us and keeps us on our journey. Rise to your feet. That spirit of despair, that spirit of depression, that spirit is afraid in here. Is very much afraid. I have authority, big authority, to chase that spirit away. If you want prayer and this spirit of despair and depression has come upon you, I know you're in here. Come for prayer and a breakthrough is to happen in this place. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Come, come, come.